I'm delighted to stand before you today to honor the person and enduring legacy of John Pete Hammond. Many here had the privilege of working with Pete. Believe me, collaborating with Pete, there was never a dull moment. I remember countless meals, uh, conversations, even walks or runs across an airport were exciting. <laughs> Pete's vision for faith and work stood in stark contrast to that of the organized church, especially in the 1980s and 1990s. In exercising this unique role of provocateur, meddler, rascal, and this is my favorite, disturber of the peace, <laughs> Pete never lost hope or joy, joy, and he never gave up on organizations and people. Now, most of my reflections today will focus on Pete's 40 plus years of service with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, but he was also faithfully involved in a broad array of church circles. He was a member of Christianity Today for 27 years. He was a long-term board member of Belhaven College, Presbyterians for Renewal, and the Coalition for Ministry in Daily Life. Now, to understand Pete, you have to know a little bit about his, his growing up years. Pete's parents met at a rodeo in New York City. His dad was a rodeo rider, his mom a New York, a New York City model, and they met, sparks flew instantly, and Pete followed shortly thereafter. <laughs> Pete's childhood was characterized by high mobility, uh, which I'm sure contributed to Pete's love of adventure. By the seventh grade, Pete had attended 10 different elementary schools. The Hammonds finally settled in upstate New York, where Pete spent hours uh, doing daily chores, sometimes milking 30 to 40 cows a day. Pete especially loved horses, and he eventually followed his dad into the rodeo life. Uh, by the age of 16, Pete was New York uh, State trick riding champion. Now, Pete's early years were not just characterized by adventure, but also learning to cope with an alcoholic dad. And that was a struggle for him, and Pete, it, it led Pete into a, a deep journey of spiritual and emotional wholeness, which he shared openly uh, and really helped others all the way through his, his life. After graduating from Houghton College, marrying, attending Gordon-Conwell, uh, and uh, stints as a high school teacher, a youth pastor, and a, and a camp director, Pete joined InterVarsity staff in 1966. It was during this period um, that he moved to Tulane University and directed campus ministries across uh, Louisiana and Mississippi and eventually all of the south southeast uh, United States. And what he did is he integrated the campus fellowships in the very difficult years after the Jim Crow laws. I've been told that the FBI uh, had a file on Pete. Uh, numerous sources, I couldn't, I couldn't verify this, but. But no one can tell me for sure why they had the file, um, whether it was a form of protection for Pete or whether they wanted to monitor his behavior as a potential rabble raiser, primarily pushing against uh, issues of systemic just injustice uh, that were so prevalent at that point in our history. Pete was even asked to become a Black Panther, uh, which, which may explain the FBI's interest. <laughs> he, he, he joined, he, he joined out of solidarity, but he withdrew his membership after the group uh, shifted to um, violent resistance. In 1978-79, while on sabbatical, and I love this as a former InterVarsity staff worker, InterVarsity gave away his job as a ploy uh, to get him to move to Madison, Wisconsin, where the, where the uh, InterVarsity is based. Once he agreed to come to Madison, Madison the senior le leaders surrounded him and they said, Pete, we've got an Urbana issue. In Pete's own words, this is what they said. We think we have a problem. We're hearing comments like Urbana. That's where you go to become a career missionary or feel guilty about the rest of your life. <laughs> now it was that moment, 1979, that started, that really launched Pete into this deep exploration of work and faith. Over the next decade, Pete launched out on, a, on an aggressive uh, faith and work conference agenda. He hosted Washington 80, San Francisco 83, and Marketplace 86, which were big national conferences at the time. He also uh, started InterVarsity's Marketplace Ministry Department and the Metier Networks Magazine. Some of you will remember that. During this, pe during this period, Pete also began to work on the Work and Life Study Bible, which uh, was co-led by Bill Hendricks. The Word and Life Study Bible really broke amazing new ground in connecting the gospel to everyday responsibilities, including family, work, economics, 
and everyday life. Pete worked on the Word and Life Study Bible for um, 10 years. And the project changed his life rhythms, uh, in his words, from a highly verbal activist and insomniac to a reflective and early 4 a.m. riser who enjoyed seeing others lead and step into the limelight. In addition to the Word and Life Study Bible, Pete also authored or co-authored several other books, including the, market, mar the annotated marketplace bibliography. Also in the mid-1990s, Pete was commissioned by Robert Cooley former president of Gordon-Conwell, to help launch and crystallize the mission of the Mockler Center, which is playing host to, to our conference this weekend. One of the other things that Pete did was start a radio show uh, that played on hundreds of uh, stations a couple times a day around the country. And uh, let's, let's take a minute to listen to Pete in his own words. Welcome to Marketplace Voices, a ministry of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Here's Pete Hammond. Have you ever thought about how the Holy Spirit relates to work? Often we view the Holy Spirit as only related to evangelism or world missions. But in Exodus chapter 31 and 35, we're told about how God empowers workers to do carpentry and stonework, masonry, jewelry making, and tapestry. This is an assignment to build the temple of God. Many will say then, the Holy Spirit was only given to build that one building in the Old Testament. But the New Testament tells us that we are now the temple of God, and hence the Holy Spirit is given to empower us to fulfill Genesis chapter 1, to be workers for God. As Dorothy Sayers said, every maker and worker is called to serve God in his profession or trade, not outside of it. Martin Luther said that nothing you handle every day is so tiny that it does not continually tell you of the significance of work. You have as many preachers as you have transactions, goods, tools, or other equipment in your house or home. Now, Pete and his wife, Shirley, were students of culture and the arts, which may explain how he got this uh, mischievous grin and slightly, <laughs> slightly sinister twinkle. <laughs> Pete always had a project going. When he went to a new city, he would, he would, he would study the church yellow pages. I was amazed to find this out. And then he'd visit some of the churches to see if his perceptions lined up with what was actually happening in the church. He was an avid reader and note sender uh, in, the faith, faith and, in his faith and work advocacy. At one point, he had 56 active subscriptions, everything from Ebony, Jet, Catholic Digest to the Intelligence Report. Each day, Pete would tear articles out of journals, and some of you may have received these, and, and you'd get these things in the mail. He'd send them to friends all over the world, and there'd be scribble marks and like lines connecting things, and, and you just sort of, sometimes you'd get it, and sometimes you'd scratch your head and say, you know, Pete's just two to three steps ahead of me. I have no idea what he wants me to see here, but I know Pete knows what he's doing. One of the ways that Pete's legacy uh, lives on is in the Work and Faith Library Collection at, at Seattle Pacific University. Pete, in 2008, dedicated uh, and gave his collection to SPU, and it, con and it consists of thousands of books offering a fascinating inside look at the development of workplace theology. It also uh, reflects his wonderful advocacy for people often margin uh, marginalized or on the margins uh, of, of kind of the mainstream church where their voice was not fully heard. So you see books really exploring the role of women, ethnic minorities, and of course workplace theology. You can't pay tribute to Pete without paying tribute to Shirley. She was a, a, a wife of 49 years and was a real advocate and strong person in her own right. And one of the wonderful things with Pete was to listen to his stories about their Thanksgiving holidays. They had this tradition where they would pass the talking th feather and they would just give thanks. And Pete's life in so many ways embodied thankfulness. Pete hated the word full-time Christian ministry. If he heard you say it, he would call you out and he would do it publicly too. And it was one of the great things about being with Pete. He embraced ministry to marketplace professionals long before it was popular to do so. In addition, to know Pete was to join uh, his community of, of broad leaders. He moved in broad circles. He had evangelical, mainline, Catholic friends who shared a common vision for the marketplace. For certain, Pete was highly productive in his marketplace calling, teaching, publishing, conferencing, and campus building. But he might be best remembered as the great connector. 
To Pete, no one was outside the circle of faith. Everyone mattered, and his life proved it.